Bill mentioned last week that in a couple of weeks we'd be taking a break in the series that all may believe we've been preaching through John's Gospel. And in January we'll pick back up with chapter 10. But today and next week we're going to be in chapter 9. And this will end our study for this year. Uh, Bill will be preaching Christ the King Sunday two weeks from today. And then we'll enter into Advent, um, the Advent season. This text is about the healing of the man that was blind from birth. And there's four responses to this text in chapter 9. The first I'm going to cover today, which is the response of the neighbors, the friends of this man. Next week, Bill will pick up with the other three responses. That of the Pharisees, that of the man's parents, and the reaction of the man. And God, through Jesus Christ, showing His deity in Jesus in this people. And so this is the context of this chapter. So if you have your scriptures and would like to follow along, whether you've got a hard copy or a soft copy, we're in John 9, and I'll be picking up with uh, verse 1 through verse 12. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spit on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied it, the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Therefore the neighbors and those who had previously saw him as a beggar were saying, is not this the one who was sitting and begging? Others were saying, this is he. Still others were saying, no, but it looks like him. He kept saying, I am the one. So they were saying to him, how then were your eyes opened? And he answered, the man who is called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went away and washed, and I received sight. They said to him, Where is he? And he said, I don't know. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. If you remember some weeks ago, Bill preached in chapter 5 about the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath, and it called all kinds of consternation with the Pharisees. And so, again, we see this repetition, this repeat. We know that Jesus healed the blind man on the Sabbath. Look at verse 14, as Bill will preach next week. He was healed on the Sabbath. But we need to look at what happened. Why this miracle, this sign, as John likes to use, these signs are done so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is still in Jerusalem. Uh, it is following the Feast of the Tabernacles. We've preached the last few weeks on the Feast of the Tabernacles. And Jesus is there, and um, John tells us this man is born blind. But he doesn't tell us how Jesus and the disciples know that he was born blind. Now at this time, there were people that were blind were normally beggars. That's how they made money. 
And so this man, being born blind, probably had been begging in Jerusalem for years. People would have known him. They would have known who he was, had probably passed him many times. And so as Jesus and his disciples are journeying through the city, they pass the man. The man doesn't call out to Jesus and say, oh, hey, I'm blind, heal me. He walks by. And what John tells us is the disciples ask a theological question. Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? Now, the disciples fell into a logical fallacy or a fallacy of false dilemma. What they had done is limited this question to just two answers, two options. Either the man sinned or his parents had sinned. Now, we know that there are situations, there are times that it calls for an either or answer. For example, if Ted said to me, does God exist? My answer is either going to be yes or no. I'm going to say yes. Just trust me. <laughs> but it's an either or answer. But in a false dilemma, when you have a fallacy, it would be, we're going to paint this sanctuary green or blue. And Ted would look at me and say, there's a hundred other colors we could paint this sanctuary. That's not our only option. But the disciples had limited this to only two options. And the first one's very interesting, don't you think? Did this man sin and caused him to be born blind? Think about that. He sinned in his mother's womb that caused him to be blind. Well, in Judaism at the time, there were many that believed that a child inside the womb could sin. Believe it or not. They also believed there was Hellenistic Jews that were influenced by the Greek philosophy, and they believed that a baby born with some kind of affliction was born that way because of their past life and the sins in their past life. Now, neither one of these have biblical stance, but you can understand that the disciples had this at least concept of a baby in the mother's womb could sin. The second is probably a little more plausible. Um, did his parents sin that caused him to be born blind? Is the second option. Well, we know that divine punishment is sometimes handed out. We know that because of Scripture. But we know that it's not always the case. Look at Job. Job was a righteous man. And God and Satan entered into this uh, disagreement. And Job was inflicted by losing fam family and wealth and health. And we go to chapter 39 and 40 of Job and we hear this <laughs> dissertation between Job and God. And you know, the Job's friends had said, you know, you've, you've sinned, you've done something, it's a secret, and you're just not revealing it. And Job says, I haven't done anything. And he gets to God at the end and he says, God, why? And God says, I can do with what I have created how I want. This is my creation. And so we know divine punishment is not always because of sin. A good example is Job. But we do know that divine punishment is sometimes handed out. Look at Bathsheba and David. <clears throat> and God tells David that their offspring, this child, is going to die because of his sin. Look at 2 Samuel and you can read the story. Go to Numbers 12 and you'll see that Miriam, God says to Miriam, I'm going to strike you with leprosy because you have rebelled against your brother Moses and his authority. 
And sure enough, she was struck with leprosy. Now, it was only for seven days because her brother pleaded to God that he would heal his sister. But she was struck because of her rebellion. So we know in Scripture there is a case for divine punishment. In John 14, as Bill, as I mentioned, the pool of Bethesda, as the man was healed, listen to what Jesus says to the man in verse 14. He says, Behold, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore, lest something worse may befall you. Certainly some inference there of some type of divine punishment. And of course the disciples would not know this, but we know that Paul talked about in the letter to the church at Corinth about unworthiness in taking the Lord's Supper. They abused the Lord's Supper and he challenged them on this. And when in verse or chapter 11, verse 30, he says, Many of you are weak and sick, and others have fallen, to, fallen asleep, meaning they have died, because of your abuse of the Lord's Supper. And in our own day, we know science has proved that there are consequences of drugs and alcohol and other types of things that a woman may ingest while she's pregnant that would ultimately be a consequence to that unborn child. But that's neither of the options in this story. Did the man sin while he was in his mother's womb? Did his parents sin? And Jesus says, neither. There's a third option. The third option is this. Neither this man has sinned, nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God may be displayed in him that the works of God may be displayed in Him. There was a third option, and Jesus gives it. Now, we live in a fallen world. You go back to Genesis 3, and we know that there is sin that entered the world, there is sickness that entered the world, there is death that has entered the world, and since that time, we all, all of mankind, has faced these inflictions on us. Thank goodness we also have in chapter 3 of Genesis the Messiah announced that will crush, crush the head of the serpent. But until Jesus comes back, until he comes and set, that sets this upside down world right side up, we're going to face these afflictions. And one of the things that will happen as believers in Christ, as we face these situations, um, and, and they're numerous. It's just not health. There's many other things that we face in our life. As we face them, God can receive glory. Now, Jesus, in this story, heals this man by making a mud pie. <coughs> he spits on the ground, takes clay, makes a mud pie and puts it on the man's eyes. Now Jesus could have very well just said, receive your sight, and he would have received his sight. He could have touched him and he would have been healed. He could have, as Mark 7 and 8, had, could, could use saliva and could have been healed. But in this story, Jesus chooses to heal him by making a mud pie and then telling him to go to the pool of Siloam and to wash. This is an interesting pool of water. This pool was found in the southeast corner of the city. And King Hezekiah had built a tunnel underground to bring water from the Gihon Springs in the Kidron Valley when he was afraid of the Assyrians and that they would conquer or take away their water supply. Isn't this brilliant? He dug a tunnel from the continuous spring 
in the Kidron Valley into the city and created a pool. This pool, as you see there, is coming from Hezekiah's tunnel. And this is a picture of the pool of Salaam. It had continuous water. And Jesus told the man to go to the pool and to wash. And he did. He never asked to be healed. But God chose to heal him for his glory. We have said over and over in this study that the entire purpose of John's gospel is to reveal Jesus Christ so that you may believe. And so Jesus heals him. And the man receives sight. And he comes back. You know, he had to be excited, don't you think? If you've been blind from birth and all of a sudden you wash this clay mud pie off of your your face from this water that's continuously flowing in the pool of Siloam, and all of a sudden you come out of the pool and you can see? I mean, I would be running around screaming, I think, saying, I can see, I can see, I can see. And he passes by people that have seen him beg, and they say, is that the man who's been begging? Maybe they called him by name. Is that Harvey? <laughs> He's been begging all these years. He's blind from birth. Is that Harvey? And some of the neighbors say, Oh, no, nah, that's not him. Others say, Well, it, it just looks like Harvey. It's really not him. And here's the man, and John tells us repeatedly, He's saying, I'm him. Hey, look, I, I'm the man. I've received my sight. I am Him. I'm Him. Jesus has given me sight. And so their question is, well then how did you receive your sight? And the man says, well there's this man called Jesus and he made this clay mud pie and put it on my face and he told me to go to the pool of Salaam and I did, and I washed, and I received my sight. And their next question, the neighbor's next question is, well, where is he? The man's never seen Jesus. He has no clue what Jesus looks like. He'd never seen him. He was blind when he was anointed. He'd been blind from birth. And he goes and he washes and when he comes back out of the pool and he faces his neighbors and Jesus is not, is not there, then where is it? Well, I don't know. That's, that's, that's a good answer. I don't know. I've never seen him. I don't know what he looks like. So, he begins to face, he begins to face many other people. Bill's going to preach these other three responses next week. He goes before the Pharisees. And you would think maybe they would be happy, but Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And that just really incensed them. You would think his parents were happy, but wait till Bill tells you what they said. And, and then the man bring, bring, is brought in, and, and he's actually brought in twice. And this last time, he says, you know, you want me to tell you again? I've already told you one time how I was healed. And they throw him out. And Jesus hears about it. And Bill's going to tell you that this man came to faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus asked him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he does. He does. Jesus says that this man was healed so that the glory of God could be revealed. That the glory of God could be revealed. If you have your scriptures open, I want you to look at verse 4 and 5. Because this is an important, probably a key along with that verse 3 to this text. 
Jesus, as he tells them the works of God will be displayed in him, he then says, we must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Why? Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Again, that I am statement. I am the light of the world. He does not say, I must work. He says, we must work that God would be glorified. And you work as long as the day is long. Because night's coming when you can no longer work. It doesn't matter what you have faced. And I'm not making trivial. I can look at my sister back there that has faced the last two months and know that it's not easy. I'm not saying that. But in this world, when we face difficulties, when we face hardships, when we face sickness or disease, when we lose our job, whatever it may be that this world that has fallen impresses upon us, how are we going to respond? Will our neighbors see the glory of God revealed in us? Benita said yesterday, you know, it's easy when you're in the valley of the shadow of death to have that one candle that's God's flame and you look at it, but what are you going to do out in the world? How are other people going to view your situation and how you respond? And God wants to use us. It's not easy. I'm not saying it is. But how you respond to those around you when you face difficulties in life, will be a testament to your faith and how you walk with Christ. R.C. Sproles tells the story of when he was teaching at a local college. And he said he had a friend that came to, to live with him that had cerebral palsy. And um, the man was attending college. And he said one day... The man came to him and he said, R.C., I just need, I need your time. I, I really need to pour out my heart to you. I've had some things happen, and, and I need to get your perspective on it. And so they sat down and talked, and the man said, I've got some friends at the college that I've befriended as I've been taking classes. And he said, they are faith healers, and, and they've told me that I don't have enough faith. That's why I have cerebral palsy. And he said, so they have laid hands on me and prayed for healing, and I still have cerebral palsy. He said, so they said, well, maybe we didn't pray hard enough, so they prayed again. And he said, I still had cerebral palsy. He said, so then they decided that I just needed to have more faith and that I needed to envision myself whole. And if I would do that, and they would pray over me, then cerebral palsy would leave me. He said, that, that didn't happen either. He said, so then they told me that I have all this sin that's secret in my life, and that's why God is punishing me, and all I need to do is just confess my sin, and God will heal me. He said, that didn't work either. So then they finally came up with, the final solution was, I was demon-possessed, and they tried to do an exorcism on me, and that didn't work either. He said, I'm still confined to this wheelchair. I am still with cerebral palsy. And the man's in tears talking to R.C., and R.C. shaking his head. He's, he says, I just told my friend I wanted to pray for. And he said, I prayed for him and I thank God for this man because this man was brilliant. The physical aspect of the disease had made him confined to a wheelchair, but God had given him a brilliant mind. 
And R.C. prayed and thanked God for this brilliant mind, this brilliant testimony, this faithfulness of this man. And as he prayed, he thanked God for his sweet disposition and the profound faith and witness that he had. And he thanked God for the man that this man was. And R.C. Said, said, Amen, and he opened his eyes, and the man smiling from ear to ear, and he asked, he said, do you know what you said in your prayer? R.C. said, no. He said, you prayed for me, and you called me a man. And that's the first time in all of my life that anyone has ever called me a man. You see, all of his life he was looked at as an invalid. Something less than. But he had a faith. And R.C. said this man's faith just blossomed. And people began to look at the man's faith instead of a wheelchair. This man's faith that glorified God. That in all things, it was God. We don't have to look far, even in Scripture, to see how God uses catastrophes to bring about His glory. Go to Acts 16, and you would see that Paul and Silas have gone to Philippi. And they have been teaching and preaching, and, and they're arrested. And it says that they are beaten with rods to the point of death. They are stripped, they are put in shackles, and they are put in jail. And if you read the next verse, it has always been a blessing to hear that verse. It was midnight, and Paul and Silas were singing hymns to the glory of God. Can you do it? Could you do it? Beaten to the point of death, put in a prison, naked, put in uh, shackles, stocks. And you're singing to the glory of God? The earthquake happens, the jail opens up, and the jailer wakes up, and he wants to kill himself. And Paul says, whoa, whoa, we're still here. And Paul and Silas minister, they share the glory of God. And the jailer and his family come to faith in Jesus Christ. God uses situations in our life to bring about transformation not only in us but in those around us every one of you are here this morning because God has touched you in some way even if you are here this morning and have not put your faith in Jesus Christ when you walked through this door when you got up this morning you came into this place to worship some way God has wooed you, touched you, caused you to be here today. And when you are touched by God, you should reveal His glory. I shared two weeks ago this verse, and it goes with the text today when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Matthew 12 says, You are the light of the world. This is Jesus talking. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on a lampstand, and it gives light to the whole house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and the glory of your Father who is in heaven. This is the call on our life. 
as you read this text, yes, God healed him. And God continues to heal in his way and in his time. And we don't understand how uh, John Dorfner that was on a liver transplant list now goes back to the doctor every time and the doctor says marbles. You're healed, man. You're good. I don't see any evidence of cancer. We pray for our sister here, and God is using her in some other way, and I don't know why God chooses what He does, but we look for the purpose in that and how God will use us in whatever it is that we face. Don't blame God. Turn to God and see how He is going to use you in revealing His glory in whatever you face, whatever it is. Jeremiah was prophesying. I want you to hear what he says. This is the prayer. This is what our prayer should be. This is a continuous... We, we prayed and we will continue to pray for healing for anyone that wants us to pray over. And James tells us to anoint and pray for healing. This is what Jeremiah says. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. Why? For your glory and praise. This is the prophecy. The prophecy that there would be a Messiah that would come and would heal the lame and give sight to the blind. This is our call seeing clearly for the glory of God close with this question <coughs> would your neighbors would your neighbors know that God has touched you <coughs> would your co-workers know that God has touched you <coughs> You see, the living God that dwells in us is calling us always and forever to reflect His glory in a lost world. So whatever you're facing, whatever comes your way, I know it won't be easy. But find some way to glorify God through that. And see how the joy of your salvation in God begins to minister in your life. But not just your life, the life of others. As long as the day is long, Jesus says. But, night's coming. When no one can work. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you are in the business of healing. We thank you that your glory is revealed even in um, healing that takes place instantly to those who are ministered to by those that you've given gifts of healing through medicine. Lord, may we be faithful enough to find your purpose, that we be faithful enough, Lord, to always focus on you in whatever situation we face, so that you will receive the glory, not us. It's about you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. This we pray in your name. Amen. <laughs>